So, okay, I'm going to think to now about writing successful research proposals. And when I say proposals, I'm not talking about that sort of proposal. Although I've got to admit, I've never had a proposal in my life. And at my age, I'd expect it to happen at least once. But I've done a lot of the other sorts of proposals. So if we think about the types that they are, and there's slightly different remit depending on the purpose for which you're writing. So you might be writing a proposal as part of an application for a postgraduate study, such as a PhD or an MRes. It might be that we're writing our ethics proposal. So the fact we've got an idea for our study, we just need ethical approval so we can pop off and collect our data. We might be looking and seeking funding, and there's two types of funding that we might go for. We might be writing a grant application for a fellowship or a research project, or we might res respond to tenders where people have got an idea of what research they want and they put it out to tender and you respond, you respond to that by saying how you will then go about doing their piece of research. The, the response to tenders tend to be much more constrained and you've really got to focus on what they want. So I'll try and tell you about, about things generically about these different types of proposals before thinking individually. So in terms of stages of writing any proposal then, we need to be able to frame the research problem. So what is it that we want to solve? We need to learn and research about the problem, so we might be conducting a literature review and holding conversations with key stakeholders. So we actually know how the problem manifests in real life and also how we're likely to be able to solve that. We also be, need to lay the project's logical framework and sketch out ideas for activities. So how might we go about doing research and what might be the solutions? We need to be able to visualise the proposal, so we need to be able to lay out this logical order of events so that we can actually prepare our timescales, think about budgeting. We then need to seek um, feedback from others, usually experts in the field, and ask them to provide some provisional review of your ideas um, and then to make any suggested recommendations, uh, make any suggested revisions, not recommendations, if only. Um, we can then finalise the project plan and actually start writing the final proposal, which will often be completely different to what we started with, our, our whole ambition at the beginning. We then submit and we hope for the best, keeping our fingers crossed. Expect rejection in some instances, and, but don't see rejection as the end of it. Where possible, seek further feedback from the people that are rejected or other experts in the field and revise and resubmit. Maybe not to that same funder, but to a different funder or to a different um, um, potential supervisor or university if it's a PhD proposal. So if we think about framing the research question then, we've got to think about how do we know there's actually a problem? Is it just our gut instinct? Is it something just because of our own bias? Is it just because of our own experience? Or is it because we actually objectively know that there is? It might be the fact that the problem's been flagged to us. So a lot of the research I do is with um, service providers for victims of gender based violence, and they'll come to me with a particular problem. And so they know it's there. We then still have to evidence it, unfortunately, look at the other literature, um, look at their own data to demonstrate there's a problem. We need to be able to articulate the problem in a sim simple sentence or two so that other people get it. They get it as quickly as we do. We need to make sure, going back to my ethics presentation, that we haven't framed the problem in the way that lays blame on the very people we hope to instigate change for or with. And actually, going back to the question that was asked in the, in the last session about um, working with sex offenders, um, again, I wouldn't want to blatantly be laying blame with them if I'm going to try and get them involved in the research process at all. So if I want to be um, in, uh, in, including uh, people that have been um, convicted of sexual offences in the research project, I want to frame the question in a way that's palatable to them. Otherwise, they're not going to take part and I'm not going to achieve my objective. So what I want to say why this, this project or this problem is relevant, who's likely to be impact if we don't resolve the problem and what is the likely extent of any negative impact to so show the enormity of the problem really and for who's going to be harmed. Often, I mean, when I've done things like um, cost benefit analyses for projects, uh, it's not just 
the um, client group or the victims themselves that are likely to be further harmed or the most impacted. We can look at society and how society is impacted by not providing a service to survivors. Um, you know, so we can look at the NHS, the criminal justice system, um, child protection um, services. There's a whole range of people that um, are affected in some way. In terms of learning about the problem, then we're going to need to explore the literature, but you haven't got the time usually to do a really thorough literature review that becomes part of the project itself. But one way to do a cursory, cursory literature review is to start by looking for review articles. So if you start by those who's who's already condensed the knowledge out there, then look at when was the last review article done and what articles that have been published since then so that you can actually update from the last review so you know where the current state of play is. You've got to know what's currently being done. If you can see particular authors who are constantly writing on this one topic or that are recently writing on the topic, it's always also worth contacting them just saying, is there anything else that they know of that's happening in this area or are they themselves doing anything so that you're not immediately replicating something that's already been done. So when you're looking at the literature, what are you hoping to glean from it? I, I always draw up a template for gathering data from things and any of you that have been my PhD students know this. So I think Amy, I think you might be in this session. You, you'll know me and my data collection templates. So we want to think, ask things like what research questions have previously be, been proposed? What methods have other researchers used to study this phenomenon? What are the strengths and weaknesses of these methods? So this will help us start to think about what methods will we ourselves use. So what scales or tools have other researchers used? Are these valid, reliable? Are they, do they have cross-cultural validity? Do they have, um, are they internally reliable across time? You know, you need to think about all these things. Are they dated? Are they gender biased? So think about the tools that have been used and critique them. What have been the inclusion and exclusion criteria for participants in previous studies? You know, is there, is there been something missing from the way in which people have gathered data before? So if I think about some of the studies that I critiqued years ago, um, so the NSPCC studies looking at the stented child sex abuse, I critiqued these on the basis that they only, only um, recruited young people uh, under the age of 21 to the, to the studies. Um, and from my own findings from studies years ago, I'd found that actually um, up to a third of people were amnesic for memories of childhood sexual abuse up to an average age of 30. So even if you'd have asked them behaviourally, had they experienced any of these things as a child, they'd have categorically said no, because it was not in their memory bank that that had happened. Yet after that date, they would have done. Um, so for me, when I did my study trying to look at the um, at this topic, I purposely recruited an, an older sample to actually overcome this problem. I've also looked at studies where I've looked at sexual re-victimisation and looking at the um, long term impacts on people. And then when I've looked at their other studies um, exclusion criteria, they've excluded anybody that has a mental health problem or has had a mental health problem in the last two years. So actually, you're actually excluding the people that have had an issue that have most probably to do with their experience of child sex abuse. And so it becomes a problem. So it's about being able to critique the sampling that other people have used. So it informs your sampling choices. You look at the practical procedural issues that have been implicated in conducting the research, uh, either in the area or with this population. What are the difficulties people have encountered and how have they overcome those? Because chances are you'll come across those same things and it's better to be forewarned. Think about the ethical issues that have been addressed in the other studies. Weirdly, in quantitative studies, we tend to t not talk as though there was any ethical issues that arose. Um, whereas if you look at qualitative studies, particularly qualitative studies by feminist researchers, they'll have often written a separate paper purely on the ethics of their study and their ethic ethical understanding of that's emerged since. And so if you can not only find the, the study itself, but to find the paper that goes alongside with the ethics, well worth reading. Think about what were the issues? How were they addressed? Did, did that work? And again, that will inform the ethics part of your own study. We also want to think about what ethical perspectives have been used when studying this phenomenon. 
do these perspectives work in terms of what you want to look at? Are the, the, the perspectives fit for purpose or is there a new theory that's needed or can we draw a different theory from a different area? Not only can you draw information from um, the literature, you also want to be able to uh, chat to people that um, have a vested interest in the problem that you're planning to research. Dexter being very argumentative. Um, so you need to think in terms of what organisations might be able to use your research findings to inform their practice. So what you want to be able to do is if you're trying to think of a solution to a problem, could that, that solution actually work in practice or not? And the best way of knowing that is to talk to people in the know. You also want to talk to groups of individuals who are affected by the way in which your research is conducted or the way in which the findings are presented. So if I give you the example with some work I've just been conducted with um, uh, Rachel Armitage on um, family members who have a family member who's been convicted of online child sex offences. In planning our survey and the interviews for that, we actually had two members who, who were from that population on, on our advisory group who actually looked through and did a pilot of our um, of, of the survey and and the um, interview thing. So we knew whether or not it worked for them, was, whether the wording was appropriate, whether the sequencing worked, was it tra uh, re-traumatising for them? Were they able to express their experiences logically um, or did it miss anything? And all of that was really, really helpful to go through. We might also want to identify powerful individuals, those who might be positioned to inform policy. Can we get their opinions right, right away? Is there something that's coming up that this would fit within the agenda of what's going on currently? Or would it sit in total opposition to what's currently on the table for agenda setting? We also want to inform, uh, get together with knowledgeable individuals. So those who are deemed to be experts in the area, they'll know of things that we don't know. They can, you know, at a drop of the hat, tell you something about a particular issue or what's coming up that they know of somebody else that's already researching. So I think you don't have to do all of these, but to get some of these people on board that you're just having conversations with, you're not doing research with them, you're just having conversations with them to help you shape your proposal. So having framed the problem and you've now understood the gaps in the knowledge and you've got an understanding and contextual considerations, you can actually be begin to plan your actual research activities. So you need to clearly define your objectives that will help you to fill your research aim and each research activity you plan to undertake needs to map onto one or more of the objectives and to be really clear as you go of what is it I'm hoping to achieve from this, how does this fit in the overall picture. You need to think about how each stage might inform the next stage or, or actually support you in gaining further participants. Identify each of the key milestones, which, you know, things we think actually this is a landmark event. I've now completed this part. I moved to the next part um, and they might have standalone outcomes um, for you or outputs for you. In terms of visualising the proposal, you know, here at Huddersfield, we love a good old Gantt chart. Um, so we, on all your progression monitoring as students, we tend to use them and I know that we use them really well in none in three. They really do help you to actually see all the activities that you've got to do to fulfill each of your objectives. You can then look at where you're trying to bunch too much. Are you being realistic about your time scales? Have you got the resources to be able to do that? What other things are coming along? This really helps you to plan and always build in contingency time for when something might go wrong. So leave yourself time at the end for um, where things have gone wrong that you've, you, can, you can backfill. Within your Gantt chart, you'll be able to highlight your milestones as well as the activities you're currently working on. And actually it'll give you a sense of achievement being able to see things get marked off. All of those things relate to all the different proposals you could write but there are actually different tweaks for different um, audiences. For PhD applications, you're not going to change the world with your PhD. It might feel like it at the outset that that's what you're expected to do, but you're really not. You just are being asked to do um, a feasible um, study looking at a simple thing that becomes much bigger when you start to look at it. Don't make it big to start with. It gets big by itself. 
And is it feasible? Are you likely to get access to the people you want access to? And um, I've seen lots of people I've had seen proposals over the years where they're going to interview serial killers. And I've often said to them, well, personally, I don't know many serial killers or that have actually identified themselves to me. And I don't know whether you do, because I don't know how easy it's going to be for you to get access. There's this sense that you'll you'll be given access because what you're doing is important. I can tell you now you won't be. Um, and gaining access is incredibly hard. So think about something that's actually feasible and doable. For ethics proposals, it's it is all about the design. And I know we, there's big discussions within ethics committees about whether research design and methodology should be considered as part of ethics. I've always said it should, not not heavily. But if you've if you've created a study that's meaningless, you are going to be wasting people's time, and that's an ethical issue. So actually, I think, yes, I think we should be looking at the design, but also about are the processes that we're planning actually um, empowering for our participants, particularly when our participants are victims of gender based violence. If we're um, conducting studies with perpetrators, on the other hand, we'd want to make sure that none of our processes and procedures are condoning of what they've done holding them to account while also still being respectful to them. In terms of grant applications, we'd also be wanting to think about, is this value for money? Is this money worth spent? Are you going to be able to actually do the project within the timescale and have a meaningful outcome? Do you have the right skill set to be delivering that? And have you got the right other people involved to be able to do this? Are you competitive in comparison to other people that would be going for this? Whereas PhD applications, you're hoping that you do get through. Ethics usually will get through eventually, but you might have to do a few resubmissions. With grant applications, there's a much higher likelihood that you will get a rejection. And it might not be to do with the quality of your paper, it's to do with the competition that you're up against. So it's to prepare yourself for the fact that you might not always win, but you've got to give yourself the best opportunity. Um, they take time. All applications take time, but possibly grant applications will take that much longer um, because you really want to do the best you can. Now, unfortunately, with responses to tenders, these are very different. So these might come out from local councils, police and crime commissioners, the NHS, various um, charities and other bodies will suddenly release a tender. Um, and I've responded to a lot of these over the years, and often there's a turnaround of two weeks or less. Now, within the university, we'd have to give a two week turnaround to get something through our pre award team. But often these are much, much tighter. So you don't have the luxury of the six months to a year to work on the grant application. You are literally having to pull this together really quick. The difference is, is they've normally identified what the problem is and they've got some some solution in mind and you've just got to fit around that. So you haven't got to do the same level of groundwork in framing the problem. Um, that's already done. But you do need to be able to demonstrate that you are the right person or the right team to actually be taking this on. You've got the right skill set. You've got the availability. You've got past um, track record in delivering on this type of thing. Um, all those things will, will make a difference. To be honest, I think in terms of uh, that you've mostly got a greater chance of winning a tender, the money tends to be far less, the demands tend to be equally, if not higher than grant applications. Um, so you, but you're doing it for a fraction of the of, of the payout. So if you're looking at buying out of teaching or other duties, they tend to not buy out in the same way that grant applications will. And, but often they can lead to um, academic publications, but maybe not at the same level as you would have got from a um, a grant application. The trouble is with these, chances are you'll get knockbacks. Not, knockbacks are good, they're just learning exercises. Always use the feedback that you've been given and do, do resubmit and work with um, any advice that you're given. Sometimes you have come up with a barking mad idea. I think I've done that myself on one or two occasions and you just have to accept you're going to have to go back to the drawing board. But most of the time you're doing it because you've you've got a good idea. It just needs fine tuning um, and to reach out to other people. Don't feel that you've got to do this on your own, particularly with PhD applications and ethics. Do reach out to other people. Um, 
potential supervisors, people you think have supervised you in the past at other levels, or people that you know that are experts in the area who might be interested. Um, people are always willing to help and to give advice on these types of things because we want to see the research in this area grow. Um, so yeah, make the most of all these opportunities. And I've just put together a few helpful resources to get you going. Again, we don't do it on your own. Get get other people involved and um, and be creative, but know the subject that you want to research pretty well before you go and plan something because you don't want to be reinventing the wheel. Thank you. Have you got any questions? I'm going to come and jump out of that. Thanks questions? for that, Nadia. We have got we have had a, a, a couple of questions um, yeah. that have come through, which I'm going to try and ask in a way that makes some sense. Um, so you, you mentioned at one point in, in terms of uh, ethics when writing research proposals that there tend to be um, ethical papers for um, people tend to have written about the ethics when they're doing qualitative research, but less so when they're doing quantitative. And I wondered if you could tell us anything that might be helpful about research ethics for quantitative research. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you've got to think you've got to go back to the qualitative stuff and just think about what it is that they've done and can you apply this to your own research? It's just it's a cultural thing that we tend to write as though it all worked as it should have done when we're doing quant stuff and I've been guilty of this myself in the past. And so therefore we don't want to admit to any anything going wrong and it's because we don't practice reflexivity in the same way whereas when we're doing qualitative research part of what we do is normally we have to engage in reflexivity and we've not normally got all these thoughts that we've had and had to mull over and the natural thing is is i better publish that to help others um, whereas because with the quantitative we're still trying to maintain that objectivity we hide from the fact that something went wrong um, because it doesn't match with this. It was objective, it worked perfectly. It never bloody did. You know, <laughs> it, never, it never did. So unfortunately, there is less written on that. But I think because there's less written on it doesn't mean to start to say that you can't start doing it. And I think it's something that we should look to do in the future. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another question we had was uh, that you, you talked about um, approaching key stakeholders and identifying key stakeholders for a piece of research. And I wonder what your advice would be uh, in terms of at what stage in writing a research proposal you should start to make those approaches. At the very beginning. Okay. At the very, very beginning. Because I mean, when I've done it, um, you can only because I've got involved with stakeholders over the years by accident. You know, you just meet them and they said you can't let go of them ever again. So some of them become sort of best friends. Um, but it means that when I've got a bad, mad or bad idea now, I share it with people immediately um, and then we shape the idea together because they'll know what's happening often on the ground. Um, you know, but, you know, so it's, you've gone slightly off tangent with your idea because it doesn't fit with practice or what, what's feasible and they can help you shape it. So don't delay, get them involved right at the outset. And don't be frightened to contact organisations. A few won't have time for you, but most people will welcome you in with open arms because they're desperate for research to be done. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and one more question was, um, you've talked about defining research objectives and that that's something that uh, from, I, I could be completely wrong about this, but it seemed to be sort of fairly late on in the process of actually starting to put the proposal together or starting to investigate an area that is when you would put those objectives in that they're not something you start with at the beginning and I was just wondering how likely it would be that your objectives might change and move around while you were writing a proposal. Um, they could do. They could also slightly change in the midst of your research, particularly if you've got several stages to your research because you might have decided that this is what you're going to do and I'm thinking about one of my particular students at the moment, and I don't know whether you're here, but I'm not going to mention your name just in case. Um, really strong project plan at the outset of the PhD, knew exactly what they wanted to do, start on a smaller part of the study to start with, which turns into something that generates absolutely fascinating novel data that's really meaningful, but it means you abandon the latter part and some of the objectives have to change and new bits of interviews have to be done. Um, so I think, but I think having 
good, clear objectives at the outset is important. It, it gives you a roadmap. You know why you're doing what you're doing. And if you need to change it, there's usually some very good reason why you have. Brilliant, thank you. I, did, that I have got one one final final question, which is that we've, we've had a request for um, a copy of the presentation. So yeah. I don't know if you're able to share the slides. Can I put them into, is it into the Teams link or somewhere? Oh, I, I don't, I, oh, no, no, I don't know that, that, will how well that would work. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll, if you send them through to me um, and yeah. I'll put a copy of them on our, on our website and we can email everyone at the end of the week. Excellent. Um, and yeah. I've sent them already to you, Nick, so I've emailed both over to you already. You have, you have. I've read them as well. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I so be, they'll be they'll be up on the website um, probably either early next week or towards the end of this week at the end of the conference. We'll try and share as much as we can. And if anybody has got any other questions, do feel free to just email me and ask. Because um, obviously just in a half hour, you haven't got much, much time to tackle much, but it's just enough to get you thinking. Um, so lovely to meet you, though.